So what I'd like to do is talk about the microbiome of temporary buildings. And first I'd like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators at UT Austin. Um, so Attila Novoselic, JP is here, uh, Steve Bourne, and Maria King from Texas A&M University who uh, very uh, graciously lets us use her wooden wall cyclone. And then all the other collaborators listed there are working with us on an EPA funded project looking at um, permanent classrooms on high schools in the Central Texas area. So what am I, when I talk about temporary classrooms, um, and I, it was interesting because I was discussing this with some of the folks over dinner, and the first time you mention temporary, everybody um, often um, comes to the same conclusion, which is that they're temporary, but they're essentially permanent buildings depending on the situation. And so these are portable, um, temporary, uh, I see in the military you guys call them relocatable. So in some cases they are relocated, in some cases they stay where they're at. Um, they're rapidly installed to meet demand. And there's a wide variety of applications for these portable buildings. So um, we looked at portable classrooms and you can see that one on the upper right there. Um, there's certainly, for any time you have to have a rapid deployment, you need to have barracks or anything else, disaster response. Um, displaced people or refugees. Um, that's the one uh, Casey Faust, who's here with us today, uh, provided that picture on the, the lower end here. And one thing that sort of struck me as I was looking at these pictures is this is a portable classroom in the United States, and that's the refugee housing in Germany. So draw your own conclusions there. Um, and certainly you'll see them at construction sites as well. So um, I wanted to see how this might relate to some of the folks in the room here with DOD. And um, of course, you guys have your own relocatable or temporary buildings, barracks, offices, medical facilities, dining halls, etc. cetera. Um, here is an image of one of these. In this case, it's a SIP design, um, a portable building. Um, and you'll see there are some very common features with the temporary buildings that um, we looked at. And I thought another interesting uh, feature is that the, the General Accounting Office has been looking at this, um, trying to understand it from a cost perspective. So I pulled this quote out, which was, the military services acquired over 4,000 relocatable facilities at an estimated cost of about 1.5 billion over a five-year period. And the Army had done, that was in 2009, the Army had done a sort of similar assessment and they estimated a little over 400 million in a four year period was being spent on these re relocatable buildings. So um, I don't know the actual numbers you guys use in the Department of Defense, but based on the cost there, um, I'm assuming you use quite a few. And what I want to do is talk about a, uh, such a Sloan-funded study looking at the microbiome in portable classroom buildings. And in the United States, if you've, um, well, especially in our area of the country, Texas and other places, you will see these whole schools, essentially, that are uh, put in portable classrooms. Um, we estimate there's over a half million of these portable classrooms in the US. Um, they're portable, but not temporary. Um, in Austin, there was a little a study that was done and they estimated that about 60% of the portable classrooms that were still in place were over 25 years old. They have, in uh, the Air Resources Board in California, done a nice kind of a survey study and identified that these portable classrooms have poor ventilation, water intrusion problems, and uh, formaldehyde issues. So what we wanted to do is look at the effect of ventilation conditions um, in these portable classrooms on the microbiome and actually the indoor air quality within these structures. And another aspect that came out is we wanted to look at the relationship between the microbiome in the occupied space and that that's present in the hidden space. So whether it's wall cavities, You've all been in offices with a ceiling plenum. Have you ever stuck your head up above that plenum and wondered what's there? Um, probably shouldn't if you have a dust allergy um, in general. I've, I've tried this. Um, but you know, whether you're looking up or you're looking down, there's all these unmaintained hidden spaces. And we were interested to understand, do these contribute to the microbiome in the occupied space? 
So our study design was to measure the existing conditions in a sample of portable classrooms in a hot, humid environment. And what we wanted to do is, exist, what's the ventilation conditions as is, and then basically flip those ventilation conditions so we have positive pressurization, which means you have fresh air flowing into the, the building. Okay. And uh, that's one of my collaborators with his head in the um, ceiling plenum. Um, we looked at us, the, both the environmental conditions, ventilation, the tightness of the building envelope, um, pressure differentials, temperature, relative humidity, uh, particulate matter. We also looked at the microbiology. We did surface samples, air samples in the classrooms and in the hidden spaces as well. And then we were collaborating with uh, folks who looked at formaldehyde, uh, VOC concentrations, and selected SVOCs, phthalates, flame retardants, and that sort of thing. And what we wanted to do is look at the way um, if you look at the upper right here, how the air flows through the system. You'll notice there's a wall-mounted HVAC unit, which is very common in these systems. I'm showing you a cross-section here of a portable classroom that has an attic. And what we were concerned about is where you see that infiltration, for instance. Are we drawing in microorganisms from the crawl space, which isn't maintained, into essentially the occupied space of the classroom? And you have to keep in mind that in these classrooms, the, there might be 20 or 30 students in one of these portable classrooms. And ultimately what we'd like is this positive pressurization where we essentially have fresh uh, air blowing into the building and ultimately it's flowing from the occupied space out and that uh, prevents unintentional, if you will, exposures uh, through these hidden spaces. So uh, the first thing we discovered is that it's a little more complicated than we thought. Um, if you look at a range of portable classrooms, they look pretty darn similar. So this is just a sampling of four. Um, actually outside our hotel this morning, we looked out and there was a whole series of about six uh, portable classrooms, it looked like, at a local school there. So they're everywhere. So they look very similar. You see the wall-mounted unit. Um, Oftentimes they're on actually soil, sometimes they're on uh, cement, but very similar. And it turns out that they're actually uh, quite different in terms of how their ventilation is actually operating. Not how it's intended to operate, but how it's actually operating. So some units have a fresh air system, which is a good thing. You want to draw in fresh air, so you're not essentially recirculating the same air over and over again, which of course is going to be important for exposures. And then, of course, there's the duct tape solution, which is um, actually, and this is very common to see in these hot human environments, you'll see that the fresh air intake has been duct taped closed because they are making this trade off. They can't meet the cooling load that they need, so they'll duct tape it closed, and so the air is at least cool, but it's not necessarily fresh. There's also construction differences. So um, some attics are sealed. So in the newer uh, portable designs, you'll see these sealed attics. Um, some have these um, vented attics, and that was uh, similar to the schematic I showed you initially. And um, there's some maintenance concerns. So you can see the filter on the upper right might not be doing its job properly. Um, this is looking through, and I'll show you this picture a little bit later as well, but bottom line, that's one of those vented attics it's highly vented in this case. Um, you look at the um, crawl space there, you see that in this case they haven't maintained the skirting. So um, uh, there is um, evidence that you um, get what we would call critters to um, occupy those spaces. So the issues that were identified by the mechanical and building engineers who actually went out and tested these systems is they found that really what you have is a whole range of ventilation problems um, and it varies from building to building you know where the problems are but in general they have these uncontrolled ventilation so it makes it difficult if you're looking at the indoor microbiome to say well where is the microorganisms coming from also there is what the uh, building folks would call low envelope air tightness Bottom line, it's a leaky building exterior, okay, so that allows uncontrolled ventilation. And also, even if you have a ducted system, some of those ducts in the ceiling plenums are leaky. 
Um, and obviously, I showed you earlier some of this, uh, the filter bypass and some inconsistent maintenance. I do have to say that the school uh, personnel at these different places work really hard to try to keep these uh, portables up and going. It's just a very difficult job, I think, as these portables age. Um, there's also moisture damage. Um, so um, you get water collected um, depending on where the um, portable has been placed. So in some cases, they're placed in depressions. So as the water flows in, it flows under and sits under the um, portable classroom. And if the, uh, as I said, if the skirting isn't um, well maintained, it's open to the weather and whatever else wants to make its way there. And even if you have these newer designs, you'll see that they don't have any overhanging eaves. And when it rains in our area, uh, part of the country, um, that can lead to unintentional leakage, you know, down the wall cavity. And you'll see here some weather-related damage. This is a mural window in one of the facilities we were looking at. So also of interest is how well do they maintain the indoor uh, relative humidity and temperature. And we were kind of curious about this because um, it's very important for thermal comfort and everything else for the students that they do maintain that. And so um, Attila Novoselic, who I'm working with on this project, actually just monitored and looked at the humidity ratio, essentially how much moisture is in the air as a function of temperature for the portable classrooms. And then we have essentially matched regular classrooms, those are in permanent structures, to do the comparison. And what you'll see is, in general, they're not that different, but the portables tend to have a higher uh, moisture content, as you would expect. Um, and one of the major problems that we saw, particularly in the older um, uh, buildings that have these attics and these drop ceilings, is the, um, essentially, that the, and there's that picture again, is that the attic vents are effectively straight, or are very directly in some cases, you can see the light shining through there, um, connected to the interior space, the occupied space where you're going to have all these students. So um, in our world in uh, building design, we don't like these unintentional exposures, um, but perhaps uh, Chris will tell me someday that there's particular dust that we do want to let in. So if you look at these different infiltration pathways, especially with the um, vented attics. It's really interesting. If the wind's blowing or it's a hot day, you can get what we call a stack effect, where it's basically, you know, the hot air rises. It's drawing the um, air through the crawl space. Or you can just have the wind blowing in and out of that attic, and you can get a pumping, if you will, of the air across that, um, the, the plenum space there. So the stack effects, the weather-driven ventilation, can bring contaminants, this dust, for instance, from the crawl space, attic, and wall cavities. And again, what we're hoping for is that you see that wall-mounted unit, you really want that to be sufficiently sized so it actually, under all conditions, can provide positive pressurization. Um, one of the easiest way, and these what we call low-cost solutions, because again, Certainly, if school districts had the funding, they would be building these permanent structures instead of doing these portables all the time. Um, for instance, doing ones without the attic, it's going to be much easier to seal the building envelope if you don't have an open attic. So in our um, effort, what we did is we looked at um, doing some intensive uh, microbiome sampling um, of these structures after we figured out what the ventilation conditions were. And if you look here on the right, it's just a schematic of one single portable classroom and the types of samples that we collected. We collected air samples, swab samples. Um, we also collected uh, thimble vacuum dust samples for the SVOC analyses with our collaborators, uh, Ng Zhu, in our department as well, and some white samples. And also shown here on the left is we use these high volume samplers in the occupied environment to try to get a representative uh, sample of what is actually in the air, and that's what we're going to look at here in a moment. And so what we did is we measured, we um, went to a portable classroom, and these classrooms were occupied on Friday, and then we went in on Saturday, 
and so they were unoccupied at the time of sampling, and that was actually by design. Um, one, because you know, if you're doing anything with ventilation systems, you certainly don't want it to be full of folks. But more um, directly, we wanted to actually minimize the human signal, if you will, so we could see the signal from all these hidden spaces, what the actual structure was doing in terms of redistributing microorganisms. So um, pre-intervention then, what you'll see in this particular portable, we're just looking at the shared you know, OTUs between the, the cloud there in the middle represents the air sample, the microbial community and the air within that portable. And be, this one was a near neutral um, uh, ventilation condition. And we had the outside air and the indoor air had about 22% common taxa. But we also had about 21% common taxa between what we were finding in the crawl space air and the indoor air. And then when we flipped, and all we did in these ventilation things, because uh, we didn't want to do any harm, so to speak, we just blew fresh air in. It was the simplest intervention ever. So we blew fresh air into the system. And you'll see, first of all, that the taxa outdoor um, that's shared with the indoor community certainly went up. Um, however, you'll see in this particular structure, we didn't really have much effect on the crawl space community that was still present in the indoor air. Um, if we look at the um, system or portable that had a ceiling plenum, we also looked at what taxa are present in the indoor air are also found in the ceiling plenum. And we also did it where it was present, a wall cavity. And what you see is that there's some communication here. And then when you positively pressurize, basically blow in fresh air, we did actually a pretty nice job of reducing the contribution in the indoor air that was coming from the ceiling plenum um, and, this, and also the, the wall cavity in this particular case. And if we look at, you know, um, the top five uh, tax at a class level prior to the intervention here, both indoor and outdoor pre-intervention, basically whatever the uh, ventilation conditions were, which were either often near neutral or negative ventilation. Um, and then we do post-intervention. Well, the outdoor air still looks like outdoor air. But what you'll see is you shift the indoor air community. So this is very similar to what people have shown in kind of bigger buildings. Natural ventilation works. It does change the microbial community that's present. And when we looked at across these different portables that we'd sampled, um, and we couldn't do it in the wall space because in some cases these portables don't have uh, actual wall cavities, but we looked at the crawl space and the attic space, and we looked at what's kind of some of the core microbiome um, that's present. You'll see that in the attic space, um, not surprisingly, you see soil-associated taxa because it's open to the outdoors. But you'll also see that the human-associated taxa are also present in the kind of the core microbiome there. The crawl space was heavily, the core microbiome there um, that was uh, present in all these different portables was soil-associated. Um, and if you're interested in reducing the human-associated taxa, um, I had to put the pig pen up here, uh, pre and post intervention, as you would expect, you drop the human associated taxa in the indoor air by essentially providing fresh outdoor air. Um, one of the things that was interesting though is we started, we used Source Tracker to try to determine what was contributing to the microbial community within the air, in, in, indoor air, from these different um, microbial reservoirs, if you will, in the, the portable classrooms. And so, Prior to any intervention in natural ventilation, or not natural ventilation, in the existing ventilation conditions, you'll see, for instance, we um, the portion of the microbial community in the indoor air that's uh, similar to the filter dust community is very high in this particular portable. And in this case, we're looking at a closed attic portable. There's some floor dust represented. There's some outside air represented, the wall space in this particular one. And you'll see that we also put the door handle as a surrogate for human-associated bacteria. And so prior to the essentially blowing in fresh air, you see that there's these contributions from different sources. Um, Post-intervention, we actually had a, of course, a much higher contribution from the outside air um, microbial community. You see the filter, the Sorry, the filter dust is still present. The floor dust in this particular uh, study went up because we were blowing air so hard into this particular, this was one of our first interventions, 
we actually were resuspending floor dust. We figured out how we uh, ended up doing that. But we did also see a decrease, for instance, in the wall space community. When we do this again in the attic uh, portable, um, we see first prior to the intervention, and this is one where we think there was pumping essentially back and forth, you see that the indoor um, uh, air community was uh, had quite a bit of, uh, the, well, the ceiling planet was contributing heavily to the indoor air community as we had suspected. Um, the filter dust is all represented as well. You see the crawl space in this plate, um, this particular portable was also very well represented. Post-intervention, we have a, a significant e increase in the outside um, associated taxa. We get a significant decline in the ceiling plenum, so that positive pressurization is minimizing that microbial reservoir or that communication. However, you see we, we don't do very well with crawl spaces, for example. They're still well represented. Um, one of the other questions we had is, well, how do these portable classrooms compare to the permanent classrooms at this sample of schools that we looked at. So we had a, a, another uh, project funded by EPA to look at indoor air quality in classrooms. Um, and so what we looked at here is how do the door trim communities, because we took, remember we took all these swath samples, in the permanent classrooms versus the portable classrooms, are they similar? And as you would expect, they're actually pretty distinct. So the, the blue here, the um, are the portable and the red are the, the permanent in a couple different seasons. And bottom line, the portables, which are sitting outside and have a lot of communication with the outside taxa, basically cluster to themselves um, on these door trims. And the permanent classrooms, yeah, they have doors, but they open into a hallway, which is still within the indoor environment, so they cluster differently. Um, we also looked at across this sample of um, permanent and portable classrooms, and in this case we're looking at during, these samples were collected during occupation. Um, you'll see that we have again a pretty interesting clustering of all the different uh, communities. Um, so for instance, if you look at, if we start here, you see where it says in pink outside air, so those samples of outside air and then as we move in toward, for instance, very human-associated contact uh, samples, the desktops, what we see is this gradient from fewer humans or less human-associated taxa to more human-associated taxa. So, for instance, the uh, floor samples are somewhere in between, the door trims are closer to the outside, and the desktops are um, much further over here toward the more human-associated samples. So they essentially are clustering by, you know, how much human association there is. Um, if you look at the human-associated taxa um, and the abundance of, of these taxa on just three of these samples, and again, this is across portables and permanent, you'll see what you would expect, which is the desktops, which the students are in contact with all the time, are very heavily human-associated. Um, the dust collectors, um, we use some of the ideas that Rachel Zadam's group had done, which is to, um, we call them Petri Ds. We collected settled dust during the, uh, for a week while the students were present. And this is essentially a measure of suspended dust um, in the classroom or particulate matter. And you see that because these are occupied classrooms, those also have a pretty good imprint, but the door frame, as you would expect, is lower. Um, one of the nice things about working with folks who do look at indoor air quality from a different perspective, not just microbiome, is they look at things like CO2, ozone, formaldehyde, VOCs, SVOCs. And so just to give you a flavor of what we found in these classrooms um, and how they compared essentially to match classrooms in the permanent schools, the permanent structures, you look at the portable classrooms here, which are the triangles, and compare those to the um, CO2 levels, for instance, in the permanent classrooms, you'll see that actually the CO2 levels in the portable classrooms are lower. And you're, well, you're, you know, you're packing 20, 30 kids into this fairly tight space. How is it that the CO2 levels are closer? Well, we have this benefit, if you will, an unintended benefit of a leaky envelope is that you've got air coming in from everywhere. So actually, the CO2 levels are on the lower end. 
relative to, say, a permanent structure, or a classroom in a permanent structure. What's interesting, though, let's pick it something different, an outdoor-associated pollutant, ozone, and you're gonna see the flip, the reverse of this, which is, since we have uncontrolled ventilation into the space, the outdoor ozone is more easily able to penetrate into the indoor space, and it's higher exposures than you would get in these, um, uh, the permanent classrooms. We also uh, worked with, again, with this uh, EPA team with Rich Corsi and everybody else and looked at formaldehyde concentrations. So one of the first things you think about, and when I started this project, I imagined that there would be high formaldehyde concentrations in these portables. Some previous studies had shown that. They're made with a lot of this pressed wood product. But what we found is if you compare the formaldehyde uh, concentrations in these, and I'll call them aged, Okay, well-aged portable structures, they're actually no worse, you know, they're on the same level of what we found in these, um, the permanent classrooms. And really it's what materials you're bringing into the classroom that we think is really contributing to the formaldehyde levels. And they weren't extraordinarily high either. And you see it's like range is typical for homes, maybe a little higher. We look at VOCs, um, and in general, we find very low uh, concentrations of different VOCs, but the VOCs we do see are associated with either personal care products, these are high school students, and um, um, cleaners, okay? But in general, pretty low levels. Um, I also worked with Ying Zhu, and she sampled all of the filters and the floor dust to look for a range of phthalates, flame retardants, old flame retardants, new flame retardants, and what she finds is they're actually uh, similar in uh, concentration to what she found in a survey of homes that we had done in the same area. Um, but sometimes materials matter, so you'll see, for instance, higher phthalate concentrations on the vinyl flooring, and maybe higher flame retardant concentrations if you pull it off of a carpeted uh, classroom. So what did we learn? Um, you shouldn't let uh, raccoons into the um, crawl space. Uh, that's actually uh, rain the day before, and those are tracks leading into a crawl space of one of the um, portable classrooms that we'd sampled. So there's certainly, from an engineering perspective, there's a problem with the design, construction, and maintenance of portable buildings. They were meant to be portable, term, uh, temporary, and they're in place in kind of a hot human environment, in this case, for a very long time. And it's hard to maintain those structures. Um, as part of that maintenance, what you um, see is that the ventilation is poorly controlled. And indeed, I think the, the, the uh, Attila Novoselic summarized it best. He says, all these portables are unique. Their ventilation systems fail uniquely. His, his, his take on the whole project. Um, we found communication between the hidden spaces and indoor air with regard to the microbiome. Um, open attics, we think, are a concern. You see that they work really hard to keep them screened and keep uh, any um, intrusion from wildlife and other things, but it's hard to do. Um, and also, we see that certainly if you positively pressurize the space, in this case, we did it with outdoor air, and that's what you would want to do, that certainly does shift the community so it looks more like outdoor air. You don't get this unintended infiltration through the building envelope. Um, where next, um, we have actually um, are starting a project where we have a portable classroom. It's unoccupied, and what we're going to do is it's on loan to us. We are going to actually look at more systematically um, seeding hidden spaces and tracking where those particles go as a function of the ventilation conditions in the portable. And I have to uh, thank the. Uh, schools and others that are working with us. It's not often you go to a school district and say, I'd really like a, a, a really old portable. You know, normally people would like a nice portable. I want one that's a little bit more typical. And then we're going to uh, work with it and change ventilation conditions and do basically particle tracking and microbial tracking to see how these hidden spaces um, contribute to the indoor air. And just briefly, what else? Um, this is one area of our work. Um, we do a lot with dust. Um, and uh, I'm hoping maybe you can uh, look at the dust for the protective biome for us. Uh, we also have uh, been working with Maria King using the wetted wall cyclone 
um, to look at aerosol exposures. And so these are two side-by-side -side showers. Again, we've uh, taken the human out of the story because everybody's bio is a little bit different. So we have two mannequins here. The two showers are identical, except one is a low flow uh, shower head there on the left, and one's a high flow shower head on the right. And we did the same source tracking approach, which is we sampled biofilms, wall biofilms, shower biofilms, pipe water, et cetera, to see what's contributing to the airborne community. Because I'm interested in what you might be inhaling. And if you drink the water, that's your own business, okay? But uh, if you're in, what you're inhaling. And so we looked at uh, source tracking. This is 146 days after the beginning of the operation, so it operated 10 minutes a day. Um, obviously not set for teenagers, which I think is closer to 45 minutes a day, but only 10 minutes a day. And you'll see, for instance, and this is just a snapshot, is you'll see that, for instance, the blue is the water contribution to the airborne community. It's very strong in this case on the right-hand side. We also see the green is the wall biofilm is contributing. We also see that the shower head is contributing. That's the blue there, if we look at the bacterial community. And it's different here for the uh, community on the low flow shower head. So we have a water contribution, a little bit of wall, a little bit of shower head. But you'll see the orange there is actually the air in the room itself. So we're looking at the air during the shower operation. And in this case, it reflects what was there before. Okay? And we did this repeatedly from day zero through day 146. And this is just a snapshot. What you'll see is the, the contributions to the aerosized bacterial community, they fluctuate over time. So you can't just take one point in time and say, well, that's what you're going to be inhaling. What we found is these, the relative contributions of each of these sources varied substantially for bacteria. The fungi were really interesting, though, because um, the Berkeley group and all the folks in Sloan have been telling me for a long time, outdoor fungi is indoor fungi. Well, this is sort of a little mini study of that. But if you look at the contribution that's of the fungal aerosolized community that you see um, during shower operation, if you look at the, whatever it is, peach and purple, that's really just the air that was present in the, right outside the shower and in the shower prior to operation. It's still present when the shower's turned on. You don't see some big shift. But for those of us who have trouble cleaning their shower, which I will not name any names, you see that you see biofilms are contributing there too. So you see a little bit of the shower head biofilm and the wall biofilm on the left hand side here. And very similar, very strongly air associated fungal taxa that were already present in the room prior to the shower being turned on. But you do see again some shower head as well as the wall. No, I think only in this case shower head um, was contributing. And then I just wanted to mention the movie here. We wanted to actually understand how these flow, um, how these different shower heads actually uh, contributed to the velocity. So if you look at the basically zero to seven here, the redder the uh, color, the higher the velocity of the droplets. And so uh, Maria did some beautiful work with the nuclear engineering folks actually who know how to do particle tracking and imagery to basically show us that this low flow shower head actually had higher velocity coming out of our four nozzles than the low flow, I'm sorry, than the, excuse me, the high flow, but multiple holes on the right hand side there, very much is changing the droplet distribution and even the velocity with which it's striking, in this case our target, which is um, our uh, mannequin. And then finally, there's a big push toward green buildings, and we certainly talk about premise plumbing and those types of exposures. There's also some really interesting um, exposures and things that we need to understand in terms of water reuse. Um, so we did a, a, a mini study uh, looking at what happens if you have basically well-run cooling towers. So that's not what happened in New York, where they had the Legionella outbreak. But if you have well-run cooling towers, monitored, disinfected, etc., but they differ in one key factor, which is what you're using for the makeup water supply. So are you using potable water, that's the purple, uh, reclaimed water, which I think we put in brown to be cute, and recovered water, which is HVAC condensate, all these other things that you might collect in a, in a big uh, uh, campus area. And what you'll see is that the basin water, which is essentially the cooling tower water, 
the microbial communities for A and C, which were made up of potable water and recovered water, they actually, they're mostly potable with a little bit of recovered. They kind of cluster similar to each other. But you see a very distinct shift in the microbial community associated with the cooling tower that's using reclaimed treated wastewater, treated disinfected wastewater, but you see a shift in the microbial community there. Um, the good news is, is that we didn't see substantially higher level things of Legionella and other things, so that's good news. But this does tell us that we need to understand as we look at alternative uh, reuse, water reuse options, you know, that we need to consider what those might have, what impacts those might have on exposure, for instance. And with that, I'd like to uh, reuse a slide that I've used before in, um, well, particularly in environments where the engineers are the odd people out, which we usually are anyway, so I thought I'd throw it in there. Um, we look at the microbiome from an infrastructure perspective. In other words, the, the infrastructure where we spend 90% of our time is certainly impacting what you're being exposed to. And what we need to understand is from all of these studies that Chris and all of you guys are doing is what are the, um, what's the human microbiome, what's the environmental microbiome, what is it that we want, what's healthy, what's not, and then Ultimately, if you decide that we need to change these environmental exposures, these indoor exposures, I need to change my water treatment plant, my cooling tower, my premise plumbing, my HVAC, my ventilation system, then that's where the engineers need to be involved. And that's why we like to understand mechanistically where are these microorganisms coming from, because unless I know that within the construct of the built environment, if you tell me I want you to change it this way, you can't change it this way unless you know where they're coming from. So that's been kind of our focus. And with that, I'd like to let you guys be happy to answer questions or let you go to coffee, whichever you prefer. Thanks.